Welcome to Politics and Prose. My name's Lily. I'm the events coordinator. Um, and right now we're hosting a bunch of in-person, virtual, and partnered events and trips and classes. Um, so for a full list of everything, go to our website, politics-prose.com. Um, before we get started, I have a couple of housekeeping items. So first, I'd like to ask you to take out your cell phones and make sure to silence them so that we don't interrupt today's programming. Um, when it's time for Q&A, um, following the conversation, we have a standing mic that for some of you is hidden behind this white pillar, um, but we'll be using that for the Q&A session. Um, and we just asked if you can to come to the microphone um, so that we can hear it during our audio recording of today's event. Um, um, we're also live streaming today's program, um, so any of your friends and family back home who aren't able to make it today can also watch today's program. Following the Q&A, we'll have a signing up here at this table. Um, and if you haven't purchased a copy of the book yet, you can purchase one up at the front. Um, so without further ado, um, tonight I'm very excited to welcome Scott Chain, celebrating the, re the release of his book, Flee North, A Forgotten Hero and the Fight for Freedom in Slav Slavery's Borderland. Scott Chain was a reporter for 15 years at the New York Times, where he was twice a member of teams that won Pulitzer Prizes, before that for 21 years as a Baltimore Sun. His two previous books are Dismantling Utopia, a first-hand account of the collapse of the Soviet Union, and Objective Troy, the story of an Amer American terrorist killed in a drone strike on orders of President Obama. In 2019 to 2020, he was a fellow at the SNF Fagor Institute at Johns Hopkins University, where he taught courses on media and on the Russian attack on the 2016 American presidential election. Shane will be joined a conversation tonight by Helene Cooper, a New York Times Pentagon reporter and author of the best-selling memoir, The House at Sugar Beach, In Search of a Lost African Childhood. Her work in Liberia covering the Ebola pandemic was part of a package that won the Pulitzer Prize. Her most recent book is Madam President, The Extraordinary Story of Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. So please join me welcoming tonight politics and prose, Scott Shane and Helene Cooper. Back there being shy. Being shy? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so thank you everybody for coming out on this rainy night. Scott, do you wanna have do you have any opening remarks? Or do I get no, to right, do I get right to right. run the show? <laughs> um, Scott Shane and I sat next to each other in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times for many, many years. Uh, and if you guys want to know anything Very about hard years. <laughs> if y'all want to know anything about where the bodies are buried, come to me after this. Um, when I first read this book back in March while I was on a work trip, I remember writing and telling you that it was a tremendous achievement for a white boy. <laughs> and um, you told me you were going to use it as a blurb. I see, I see that you didn't do that. <laughs> I wanted to. The publisher said no. Um, Scott's last book was about like a Jordanian jihadist, so like he has a penchant for writing about black and brown guys. But I'm glad to see this time we have a, a protagonist who we can root for. Um, uh, seriously, though, this book is astounding. Uh, Scott tells the story of these three guys, Thomas Smallwood, a black man who managed to buy his own freedom from slavery uh, and then went on to help untold others to flee north. Uh, Charles Torrey, a white activist who helped Smallwood, and Hope Slatter, uh, probably my least favorite character in a book ever, uh, a slave tracker who does what he can to stop slaves from being set free and catching them. Uh, it all takes place right here in the Washington area, and it is riveting. Uh, I'm really quite proud of you, Scott. And I will never say anything like that again. <laughs> I'm worried that this is being tape recorded. <laughs> uh, now, Scott, I sat next to him in the Washington Bureau. He's a first class investigative reporter. But in the Bureau, we're always making fun of him because he specialized in what we call historical scoops. Uh, Scott would write stories about stuff that happened 50 years ago, and they'd put it on the front page, and then tell the rest of us that our stories weren't newsy enough to be on the front page. I don't know how he did it. Uh, this book, in my opinion, is the ultimate historical scoop. 
so Scott, my first question then is when I did my book, Simon and Schuster told me to figure out the elevator pitch for it, which is, you know, just in a few sentences, what did I think my book was about? So can you give me your elevator pitch for Flea North? Wow. Uh, <laughs> Helena asked me if I wanted to review her questions in advance. I said, no, surprise me. But unfortunately, this is this one I'm not prepared for. But I'll say, uh, you know, you don't, I, you're not prepared for the elevator. I think no. I, I, yeah. <laughs> no one told me. Anyway, uh, no, I guess the two things would be <clears throat> Thomas Smallwood is a guy who should have a big statue right here in Washington, D.C., where he helped uh, many people, hun probably in the low hundreds of people, escape slavery and also wrote about it um, in a way that I think no one else ever did. And the second thing is that I, I eventually connected the, um, the Underground Railroad, which he named, that was one of the discoveries, to the domestic slave trade. And so, uh, you, you know, one of the insights that I c came to in researching this book is how the possibility of being sold south motivated many people to escape to the north. And so uh, is, is my, have we reached the eighth floor or whatever? No. <laughs> It's my pitch over. <laughs> I'm hooked. <laughs> uh, well, then tell me why you wanted to write this. Walk us through what brought you to taking this on and the discovery of Thomas Smallwood, who uh, you write is a satirical. You told me he's a satirical commentator uh, uh, who named the, who came up with the Underground Railroad name. So um, this really begins about 25 years ago. Um, when we had moved to Baltimore, where we still live, um, some years before that, and uh, the, the Inner Harbor was still relatively new. It's kind of it's in the doldrums now. But um, it was then, uh, Harbor Place had a lot of local businesses, and it was just a fun place to go. Uh, our kids were little, and I always think of pushing our kids in strollers around the Inner Harbor, buying food, looking at the boats, hanging out. And so it was a very pleasant place in my mind. And then I stumbled across the fact that for about 60 years, it was the site of a thriving slave trade. It was one of the major ports uh, shipping people from the Upper South to the Deep South. And uh, so I, all, I wrote about that for the Baltimore Sun. And actually, I got some of the same eye rolls when I proposed writing about <laughs> ancient history uh, for a newspaper, uh, but they ran it. And I always wanted to return to that because I don't think enough, I don't think Americans know enough about the domestic slave trade. <clears throat> but when I set out, so in 2020, I quit my day job at the New York Times at the end of 2019. When I started looking for a story to tell, it was very difficult to, to find a story within the slave trade itself because most of the people being sold south, almost all the people being sold south were illiterate. The slave traders were not proud of what they were doing, didn't leave a lot of written accounts. So then I started sort of expanding you know, my research, although I was still focused very much on this region. And uh, eventually I came across Thomas Smallwood, uh, who was usually portrayed as the black sidekick of Charles Torrey. But uh, as I learned more about Smallwood, I realized, no, <laughs> Charles Story was very much the white sidekick of, of Thomas Smallwood. And that was a much more pleasant way, actually, to spend the last three years <laughs> than it would have been to be um, closeted with your friend Hope Slatter in the slave trade. Uh, we'll get to Hope Slatter shortly. <laughs> um, I, uh, you mentioned the uh, Inner Harbor and the slave market uh, there. Uh, I love that so much of this book takes place right here in this area. Uh, can you t talk to us just a little bit about the connection? I mean, because uh, so many people don't necessarily think of Washington, D.C. as yeah. a hub of, you know. The slave trade, among other things, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so, so what, one of the things I learned um, back in the 90s, 
uh, when I first got interested in the domestic slave trade, um, one of the things I realized is that this region, the, the, um, the upper south uh, you know, Baltimore is obviously the farthest, uh, the biggest actually, and the farthest north uh, slave city. Uh, Washington was much smaller at the time, uh, but it was, you know, very active in the slave trade. And uh, what I realized is that it was in this region that everybody was bumping up against each other all the time. Uh, you know, there were abolitionists, there were abolitionist publishers, uh, there were slave traders, there were slave catchers, all the police, all the early police uh, were earning half of their wages by catching runaway slaves f for the uh, for the slaveholders uh, and um, and there were you know the power was in the hands of the slaveholders so uh, if you went to Boston you might meet an abolitionist but you weren't going to meet a slave trader if you went to New Orleans you might meet plenty of slave traders but you're not going to meet any anybody who's anti-slavery <coughs> overtly anti-slavery so this was kind of this boiling pot uh, also, there were you know they were the largest. The, uh, Baltimore was the largest free black population in the United States at the time. We're talking about the 1840s. Um, Washington also, free blacks greatly outnumbered enslaved blacks, but uh, slave traders were operating on the National Mall, <laughs> as well as at Baltimore's Inner Harbor. So there was a lot happening, um, and a lot of um, people who uh, hated each other, opposed each other. Um, were sort of thrown in together. It's so interesting because when you look at s slaves in this region, this is such an interesting place to look at. We're not in the Deep South. We're quite close to the Mason-Dixon line here. Um, you call this area the borderland uh, in the book. Why is, why, what are the other reasons why this area is such a focus for, for activists well I think court. I think what I realized I mean I you know um, as, as I was doing the research I, I s sort of gradually realized the um, kind of intense existential position of anyone who was enslaved in this region at the time because on the one hand people are being sold south all the time and there are in many cases in most cases they're being torn from their families, you know, wives from husbands, children from parents, um, and either marched in, in chains hundreds of miles to the Deep South to the cotton and sugar plantations, or put on a ship. In Baltimore, you usually put on a ship, and they go all the way around and, and uh, land in New Orleans, and then they'd be sold off into plantations. But that was a huge industry at the time. And a total, I mean, over 60 years, something like a million people were forced south. One of the m largest forced migrations in, yeah. in history. And, uh, and so people who were enslaved around here knew that. Their neighbors were disappearing, you know, enslaved neighbors were disappearing, their friends, family members. I think Frederick Douglass had something like 14 or 15 relatives sold south. And he was threatened repeatedly with being sold south. So, um, so they knew that that was a possibility at any time, and you rarely had any warning. You know, it's just a guy would show up, put shackles on you, you know, uh, hand some money over to your, the slaveholder, yeah. yeah, and you would be carted off to the slave jail, um, often without time to say goodbye to family, and you wouldn't know where you were going. They wouldn't know where you were going. So they had to live with that possibility every moment of every day. But they also knew that, as you say, the Pennsylvania line is not that far. So usually in Smallwood's operation, he usually says that if they're leaving Washington, they would pass, uh, they would cross the Pennsylvania line on the third night. Um, so that was doable in a way that it's, it's, it was not realistic if you're, if you're enslaved in Georgia or Alabama or yeah. Louisiana. So those, so I think people were living between these two possibilities. It was also terrifying to try to escape. Yeah. And the punishment for escape was often to be sold south. Yeah. So if you, if you decide you're going to flee north because you're afraid you're about to be sold south and you get caught, 
you know, the, the, uh, the punishment is exactly what you, you feared in the first place. So these two things are very wrapped up with each other. It's so interesting because I always <laughs> thought, of course, people would try to escape, uh, you know, with the Underground Railroad because they want to be free. But you are getting at the idea. It's not just a question of you want to be free. You don't want to be sold yes. uh, to where I assume it's, you know, far even, you know, far worse. And you don't want to be yeah. separated from your family. And that's the and that ends up feeding the Underground Railroad. It's such mm -hmm. an interesting uh, circular thing there. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, so you've kind of, uh, I think you could you could tell us a little bit more about Smallwood, but you've kind of introduced <coughs> us to Smallwood. Can you tell us a little bit about the other two main characters in Flea North? But I'd sure. like you to go a little bit, in a little bit more detail of Smallwood, uh, small, which is okay. who the heck is this yeah, guy? Yeah, so, okay, so, well, one, one thing I like to think about um, that is very striking to me is that in the, seven, in the 1840s, in the early 1840s, which is the period most of the book takes place, uh, Smallwood is living in a little house on 4th Street in Southeast near the Navy Yard. And uh, he's got four kids and a fifth on the way. His wife is a, a free woman from Virginia. He's bought his freedom, so he's now a free man. He's built a, a business as a shoemaker. So he's basically working all day long as a shoemaker to support his quite large family. He's working all night, as far as I can tell, organizing these escapes, most of them by the wagon load, because one of the things they were trying to do was not do it in ones and twos, but do it at 10 people at a time, 15 people at a time. And yet, uh, somehow he found time every week or two to send off another dispatch to this little abolitionist paper in Albany, which were in which he basically is mocking the slaveholders by name, celebrating the people who've escaped from them by name, and just generally having a good old time. Uh, and uh, he signs these with a pseudonym uh, because what he was doing was completely illegal. So uh, you know, so it's it's hard to imagine how a guy is doing all that at the same time. Charles Torrey is a um, a white guy about a dozen years younger who has grown up in the Boston area, has gone to Exeter and Yale. So where Smallwood is completely self-educated, never went to school for a day in his life. Uh, Tory arrives with this very you know, kind of high-class education. But I think in some ways Smallwood had done so much reading and absorbed so much knowledge that they were kind of on an equal footing. and. They came together at a time when uh, Tory had been involved in these endless debates over abolitionism in New England, and Smallwood had been uh, embroiled in endless debates over colonization, something Helene knows a lot about. Uh, because basically, uh, the question was should uh, African Americans, you know, pick up and move to somewhere else? Uh, give up on the United States, more or less. Uh, and in particular, the American Colonization Society was promoting going to Liberia. And so the question, uh, he supported, Smallwood supported colonization for a while and then had a complete change of heart and decided that this was sort of ethnic cleansing and that the goal was to get rid of all uh, free black people from the United States, so he turned against it. But anyway, both of them had been in overheated rooms having long discussions. And I have a feeling that when they first met in early 1842, they kind of hit it off in part because it was like, what can we do in a practical sense against slavery? And so I think that's when they got the idea of wagon loads of people in the middle of the night, you know, just yeah, heading yeah. out. And my Sorry. friend Hope. And your uh, close friend Mr. Hope Slatter. Yeah, Hope Slatter. So uh, Hope Slatter was the dominant slave trader in Baltimore and really in the region from about 1838 to 1848. And some of you have probably heard of the Pearl, which was the ship on which about 70 people tried to escape slavery. Unfortunately, they didn't get away. They were captured. And Hope Slatter sold about 50 of them <laughs> south. <laughs> he showed up here. You know, he kind of smelled uh, an opportunity to make some money. And he showed up here and carted 50 people back up on the train to Baltimore and then sold them south. 
So he was, um, his, his, uh, for those of you who know Baltimore, his slave jail, the traders had private jails, and uh, his slave jail was on Pratt Street, which is the street runs running along the harbor. And uh, he also, um, remarkably, built a tunnel connecting his slave jail to the harbor. Uh, and the reason for that was if you were moving people uh, in daylight or even at night uh, to, to the ship uh, for them to disappear to New Orleans, uh, not surprisingly, their friends and family would sometimes show up and plead and wail and make a scene. And so by, by uh, digging a tunnel to the harbor, he was able to, do, to uh, make people disappear more discreetly. So, and I guess the last thing I'll say about him is he, in addition to wanting to make a whole lot of money, his other quest seemed to be for respectability. And uh, so he, he worked endlessly to be accepted by kind of high society in Baltimore. But even the slaveholders needed somebody to look down on, and so they looked down on the slave traders. How did you pick these three guys to tell this story? To tell, I understand how you picked Smallwood. Yeah. And I guess I kind of understand how you picked um, uh, Tory. Yeah. But wow, tell me, because there were, there were several, there were a lot of slave catchers in the area. What, slave what, traders, yeah. Yeah. What, what, tell me about the inclusion of Slatter. Well, I, um, I mean. I quite liked having someone to hate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Two good guys and a bad guy. Uh, the, um, I mean, basically, I, I guess I came across them in reverse order. Uh -huh. Slatter, because my, my original focus back in 1999 when I wrote about this for the Baltimore Sun, about the slave trade for the Baltimore Sun, was the first time I discovered Hope Slatter. In part because I was working the Baltimore Sun, and Hope Slatter advertised in the Baltimore Sun almost every day. Cash for Negroes, because he was trying to find people to buy who he could sell, sell south. And so uh, I learned about him first. I then came across Tory because, you know, I'm not going to spoil the story, but, uh, but he comes to a bad end. And I thought, this is an interesting abolitionist in, in, you know, from the north in Baltimore. What's he doing there? And then I came across Smallwood. Because if you read about Tory, there's a little mention here and there of this guy named Smallwood who was helping him out. And, um, and I think, think that story was sort of filtered by um, many decades of racism. <laughs> and, uh, and they kind of had the story backwards. So it was really when I started, you know, Smallwood's newspaper columns were in this, uh, in this Albany paper, pretty obscure paper. <clears throat> and just as the pandemic shut down everything, I set out to try and get copies of this newspaper. Turned out the biggest run was in the Boston Public Library. And uh, then there were months of back and forth uh, trying to get somebody to hunt these down. And finally I did. And when I read the when I read his newspaper dispatches, I just, you know, I kind of realized he is the center of this of this book. So this is an abolitionist newspaper in Boston. And Albany. I'm sorry, in <laughs> Albany. <coughs> Uh, and he is sending basically what letters to the editor, right? Yeah, he's right. Like, yeah, I mean, it's tell us well, about, he's like a columnist, I, mean, I guess you could yeah, say. Yeah. Okay. And uh, he he borrows a uh, a name from Charles Dickens' Pickwick Papers, the biggest global bestseller of the time, uh, because he doesn't want to identify himself, uh, even though a lot of the people he's writing about are his neighbors. So. Uh, so there's immediately a guessing game as to who this guy is. But he, he signs the, uh, the dispatches uh, with the name Sam Weller. And as far as I can tell, this is the only real-time account of escapes from slavery uh, th that was published uh, at the time. And in fact, Smallwood talks about holding a column for a week or two uh -huh. to make sure the people he's sent off have made it, uh, usually to Canada. He strongly encouraged everybody to keep going <laughs> until they got to another country where slavery had been abolished. And um, so, you know, he's doing this uh, extremely uh, 
daring and dangerous thing of <clears throat> of taunting them. He's taunting, taunting them. He's taunting them. He even insisted that the editors in Albany send a copy of the paper to any slaveholder who is named. <laughs> and then he describes uh, he describes literally being somewhere in the market or at the rail station or somewhere around town <clears throat> and hearing he, I remember specifically, here's one physician who lived not too far from him <coughs> who's, um, as Smallwood puts it, whose walking property had walked off, um, <laughs> essentially reading this Albany paper and, and apparently uh, cursing loudly. <laughs> and and he's, so he's lurking among these folks <coughs> and writing about them. So it's an extraordinary situation. Um, it, it really is. I love also the idea of this portrayal of these slave owners as um, dim-witted. Yes. Can you give us an example? Yes. Well, I mean, um, you know, of course, the slaveholders and the slave power, as the abolitionists called it, <coughs> like to portray <coughs> enslaved Africans, African Americans, as incapable of looking after themselves and therefore enslaving them was actually doing them a favor because you know you could help them um, y you know cope with life and uh, so uh, he turns the whole thing on its on its head and so the slaveholders <laughs> come out as a sort of dim-witted race of uh, of people who have a hard time uh, with life and uh, in particular, they have a hard time doing much of anything. So they have these other people who do everything for them. <laughs> and when those people who are doing everything for them disappear overnight, not leaving a trace, they're kind of at their wit's end. They don't know what to do. So basically, he kind of turns over the whole racist uh, hierarchy in these, in, these, uh, in these kind of amazing letters. And uh, maybe we should talk about we should probably let people ask some questions, but maybe should, should I talk about Underground Railroad? Uh, you can. Were you going to ask me? Well, I'm not done oh, no, yet. No. Okay. I, I All have right. Like one, I have two more questions. Okay, go for it. Okay, uh, you're I'm the boss. I'm fascinated about this portrayal of the slave owner because this causes an uproar in the Washington elite, though, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, because they're uh, getting people out by the wagon load, uh, you know, 15, 18, 20 men, women, and children in, in a horse-drawn wagon. They're covering, they're disguising in some way. They're waiting until the middle of the night and they're just heading out. Um, these are coming from multiple households. So, you know, a lot of times escapes took place on Saturday night because Sunday morning, a lot of the enslaved had a little more freedom mm -hmm. to, to hang out, to go to church or whatever. And uh, so it was a good time to get away. You're, you're departure would not be immediately noticed. So you can imagine <laughs> that these people are waking up on a Sunday morning, and Smallwood literally talks about this, this phenomenon, um, and in a bunch of, you know, maybe half a dozen households around Washington, you know, it's like, wait, where's my coffee? Where's my breakfast? Hello? <laughs> Anyone there? And so, um, so it kind of causes an uproar. And, you know, I did do a rough calculation about one particular wagon load of 15 people escaping. And, you know, very roughly their value on the market to slave traders might have been $200,000 in today's dollars. So imagine looking at $200,000 of your property disappearing overnight without a trace. Uh, so you can imagine it, it caused some consternation. Ah, uh, all right. Tell us your story about how okay, the Underground so Railroad got its <coughs> All right. How, how are we doing for time? Oh, we're all, we're we're all right. Fine. Okay. Stop worrying about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. So, anyway, I'm reading through these newspapers, which have been microfilmed finally after after many months by the Boston Public Library, and they you know, they contact me and say, "Good good news. It's all been microfilmed." I'm kind of like. I was expecting to, to maybe they would digitize it, uh, this being 20, 2020s. But, um, but anyway, I went to the Boston Public Library, I downloaded it all. I start reading through these letters that Smallwood had sent to the Albany paper. 
<clears throat> and at one point he says, he's addressing the slaveholders by name um, as usual, and he's often um, consoling them at the loss of their beloved servants. And um, he says, um, perhaps the, the enslaved people he's talking about uh, got away by that underground railroad or steam balloon that one of your constables was swearing about the other day. And um, so a later, in a later letter, he, he elaborates and actually names the constable. We're talking about a police constable. And he was a somewhat notorious Baltimore police constable named John Zell who also did a lot of work in D.C. because he made most of his money as a slave catcher, returning people to their uh, enslavers for $50, $100 reward. And uh, so he was apparently uh, extremely distressed that a lot of people were escaping and that he didn't know how it was happening. So he, him saying, and somebody overheard this and reported to Smallwood, so him saying they got away by Underground Railroad, there were no Underground Railroads at the time, or steam balloon was sort of a, an experimental technology, you could say, in the, in the 1840s. So he's basically saying they must have been abducted by aliens. I have no idea how these people are getting away. So Smallwood picks up on this, and I think after putting it in one of these letters, um, he realizes this is a huge compliment to the people who are escaping and to the people who are helping him. So, he starts just riffing on the notion of an underground railroad, and he, <coughs> he tells people that these, the, the bereaved slaveholders that they should go to the office of the Underground Railroad in Washington to inquire after their lost property. And uh, he, he says at one point, the secret, he can't tell anyone the secret of the Underground Railroad because it has only been revealed to the president in his cabinet. So, uh, so, so it's very much a Washington joke, right? And uh, so he just has a grand time. But I'm thinking, like, is it possible that this is the origin of the Underground Railroad, yeah. the name Underground Railroad? So I go to Wikipedia, right? And uh, anyway, but as soon as you start looking at it, you realize that scholars have not credited any of the folklore about the origin of the name of the Underground Railroad. There's a bunch of uh, kind of folklorish uh, yeah. suggestions, but none of them hold up. So then I put Underground Railroad into these giant newspaper databases they have now. Newspapers.com, another one's called genealogybank.com, but they're huge compilations of digitized 19th century newspapers. And sure enough, the, the, uh, all the first uses were from Smallwood and from Tory, who went up and became the editor of the Albany paper and who picked up the phrase from, uh, from Smallwood. So that's where it came from. That's amazing. <laughs> that is absolutely amazing. As, as, as we reporters, we reporters love yeah, to find yeah. something out that, that you know, wasn't known before. So that was, that was really an, uh, a good day. <laughs> uh, we're going to open up to questions now. So there's a microphone up here. And while people are making their way that way, I'll ask you my last question. Uh, there's so much in this book that I think speaks to the moment we live in now. Hmm. Uh, for instance, the comparison, what you know this struck me when towards the end when you're talking about how Smallwood's kid turn, turned out versus Hope Slatter's oh, yeah. evil yeah. child. Uh, are there other who I think, I think murdered somebody? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> are there other parallels uh, that you draw between the events of this book and the times that we live in, in now? You know, I think the connection to the present and the politics of the present that has really kind of resonated with me is this really kind of mind-boggling attempt. Um, I, I'm no longer with the New York Times, so I don't have to mince words, of some politicians and state legislatures in re recent years to protect us, basically white people, and especially little white children, from American history <laughs> um, for fear that somebody's feelings should be hurt or someone should be distressed. It is, it's kind of shocking. And, um, you know, I don't want to mention Ron DeSantis um, <laughs> because he's, only, he's one of their legion out there. But, uh, but I guess um, 
you know, I guess the the one thing that I um, I kind of that dawned on me relatively recently after I wrote the book, after the book um, you know was well on its way to being published, was that we know a whole lot about the Underground Railroad, and we know almost nothing about the domestic slave trade. Yeah. I think very few Americans know hundreds oh. of thousands yeah. of people were ripped away from their family, from the place they knew, and, and shipped south. Uh, so why is that? Why is that? And the reason is, of course, that the Underground Railroad provides heartwarming roles for white people, yep. for some white people. The domestic slave trade provides no heartwarming roles for white people. Yep. And so, you know, I think for, for both blacks and whites, the Underground Railroad becomes a more, a kinder, gentler uh, way of talking about slavery, essentially. Uh, a way that's not quite as depressing. Uh, whereas the domestic slave trade is just unremitting horror. And uh, so, I, you know, so I think the, um, the way we deal with our history um, is so much um, up for debate currently. And I think that's the biggest connection. Sir. Um, where did uh, slaves get the money to buy their freedom and when they got their certificate showing that they were free, was that often um, dishonored and they were re-put into slavery? Mm -hmm. And also when they went uh, north into Pennsylvania, was the law on their side or did it look the other way and were they sometimes uh, recaptured? Great questions. Um, so very few of the enslaved got the money to buy their freedom. Um, Thomas Smallwood happened to be inherited by a woman who made a second marriage to a guy who was basically opposed to slavery. And <coughs> he, his enslaver then bought uh, Smallwood's freedom for $500 and told him at the age of 15 that if he paid back the $500, between age 15 and age 30, he would free him at age 30. And he actually put that on the record at the courthouse. Uh, so Smallwood worked out, he, he was hired out, uh, worked in a, in a number of jobs, mostly as a household servant, and earned, you know, essentially earned his freedom over, uh, over 15 years. So, um, but that was a quite an unusual um, opportunity. And, uh, the second question, I think, was about people getting to Pennsylvania. So Pennsylvania was uh, a free state. And technically speaking, if you got there, you should be free. Um, however, uh, one reason I call this the borderland is the Maryland-Pennsylvania border was, um, was just uh, thick with slave-catching police and just slave-catching bounty hunters. So if you were um, a black family or a black woman or man walking along the road, uh, you were in grave danger of somebody showing up, even just a busybody white person, and saying, you know, prove yourself to me. Uh, and if you couldn't prove that you were free, uh, you would be turned over to the local authorities who would often, most often, take you to uh, jail, uh, the city jail in D.C. or Baltimore, until they could find your enslaver and see what they wanted to do with you, which in many cases would be give them to a slave trader, I want to sell them. Uh, and even worse, if you were free, even if you were born free in Pennsylvania or even up in New York, uh, as those who've read the book or seen the movie 12 Years a Slave know, you could be um, grabbed by unscrupulous people and sold into slavery. Uh, and it was, it was not an uncommon phenomenon. So I guess uh, that would mean that uh, former slaves who were south of Pennsylvania, who were actually free, uh, could often be yes, re-enslaved. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, there were gangs of kidnappers who would go into the streets of Baltimore sometimes and grab people, and, uh, and probably Washington. I want to thank you for your book and your research. Well, thanks for coming. Particularly as an African-American and educating my son on black history.
we were having a discussion not long ago about the Underground Railroad. Mm -hmm. and it so happens he asked me, where did the term come from? Ah, there Now you go. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank you for that. I just have a real simple question. Did you refer to the tunnel that was built to, to secrete slaves in there, travel from the jail to ships? Yeah. Do we know what happened to that tunnel? Well, if the only way, way we know about the tunnel um, is three things. One is in uh, 1937, uh, there were some people, workers, digging into under the streets uh, to put electrical conduits down, mm. and they found this tunnel, and they realized that it was very close to where Slattered had his jail, so it was written up, actually, in the, in the uh, Baltimore Evening Sun at the time. And then, again, some people found a different part of the tunnel. It was a similar story. They were digging under the streets in about 1960. And uh, the final thing is, as some of you may know, uh, during the New Deal, writers were paid by the government to go out and do a number of things. And one of the things they did was interview people who had been enslaved. Uh, who were still living in the 30s. A lot of them were in Baltimore, actually. A lot of the interviews were done in Baltimore. And uh, there was a guy by the name of Rezin Williams who said he, he was free at the time, but he was hired to lead groups of people of the enslaved um, through this tunnel. Uh, and They had and a black guy leading a black slaves? Guy, a, black, a free black man was paid by the slave trader to lead people through this tunnel. So anyway, that's the, that's the basis of, of, uh, of that belief. Okay, but there's no details as to where the remains of this tunnel. I mean, I know it? where they are because his it's between his jail on Pratt Street and it goes, it's probably like <clears throat> two blocks long and it goes right to the harbor. Is it recorded any place? It's, uh, it's only recorded in these kind of random finds. Um, Maybe someday someone will, will create, a, you know, like a, a museum of the slave trade and, you know, run an elevator down there or something uh, because we all ought to know more about that bit of our history. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm from Syracuse, New York, and took my uh, nieces to Harriet Tubman's house in yeah. Auburn, New York, at mm -hmm. one point. And, uh, Little Kristen, after going through the house and taking the tour, comes out and looks around the place for a while, and she finally comes up to me and says, it's a railroad, right? Yeah. And I said, yes. She said, well, where are the bus shelters? <laughs> uh, my question concerns, like in Syracuse, one of the famous episodes of uh, busting people out of jail was the thing called the Jerry Rescue, mm -hmm. where Garrett Smith who was among the most wealthy people in the United States, was also among the most radical. Uh, does he have any role in your accounts? He does, yeah. So Jared Smith was a very wealthy guy. Uh, he inherited a lot of money, made a lot of money, and got very interested in the anti-slavery cause. And he, f he probably financed some of this stuff. There's no record of it, but it's, it's, uh, he knew Charles Torrey very well, and he probably contributed um, uh, and, and also, he gave a speech uh, right before these guys started their operation. This guy, Smith, gave a speech that got a lot of attention. It was called something like an address to the slaves. And it, for the first time, I think, uh, um, in a very prominent speech, an abolitionist said, if you can escape, escape. If you have to um, borrow your enslaver's horse, or money, or food, you know, he owes it to you, take it. Um, it was a very radical speech. It got a lot of, att a lot of attention, a lot of criticism from abolitionists. Um, but these guys in Washington, Smallwood, and Tory, I think, were listening. So. Yes, ma'am. Can you tell us a little bit more about the sources? You talked about the newspaper uh, yeah. letters, but where else did you find information, say, on Slatter or? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say the newspapers were by far the biggest source of information, not just of Smallwood's letters, but the, the Baltimore Sun of the time, the National Daily Intelligencer and other Washington papers. 
um, were enormous sources uh, of information. And uh, the ads. So, you know, b both those papers and a lot of others every day would have runaway ads. So it would name somebody who, who had fled and it would be placed by the enslaver who's saying, you know, $25, $50 reward for returning this person. And um, so there was enormous amounts uh, of information in the newspapers. Beyond that, uh, you know, National Archives, um, some of the county court records, um, Lots of 19th century books that are relevant. I was amazed at how many were digitized, which was very helpful during the pandemic because the archives were closed, the libraries were closed. Um, but for example, Charles, Charles Torrey, somebody pulled together a, a kind of memoir from his journals and uh, letters after his death, and it's digitized, you know, so you can just sit at home and, and read these things. So those, are, those would be the main sources. And how did you find the letters you talked about in New Orleans of the people looking for their families? I mean, those are published in many papers. So, so uh, these are sometimes called lost friends ads. For decades after the Civil War, uh, African American families were placing ads in papers saying, Has anyone, uh, does anyone know where my mother is? Does anyone know where my daughter is? Uh, they were sold, you know, a lot of these, and some of the ads that I quote were, s people s were sold by Hope Slatter. And the name Hope Slatter sticks in the name of the family, uh, so that's a clue as to where maybe they went. And uh, so these, <coughs> these ads were this kind of long, um, terrible trail of the slave trade where people were looking, um, in most cases without success, for family members who had been lost to the slave trade. Um, so they're, n they're not hard to find. And there, there was actually an exhibit of, of them in New Orleans. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Scott, congratulations. Sir. Such an inspiration to see you take this uh, idea and bring it to fruition. Thank um, you, sir. Uh, two questions. You said you think Americans need to know more about the slave trade. Can you t say something about what you learned about it in the course of writing the book? And two, how did your guy, how did Smallwood, can you say anything about how he escaped detection for so long without <laughs> giving away uh, too much of the book? <laughs> um, okay, what did I learn about the slave trade? I mean, I guess I learned that between, okay, so in 1808, as some of you probably know, uh, which was uh, the first time under the Constitution the, the international slave trade could be banned in this country. Um, Congress banned the international slave trade. It was no longer legal to import uh, captives from Africa. And it happened to coincide with the booming cotton trade after the invention of the cotton gin. And uh, so there was insatiable demand for labor in the Deep South. And it happened to be at a time when around here, in the Upper South, in the Chesapeake, the tobacco farmers had worn out the soil because tobacco will wear out the soil. And so they were, sh ship, they were swi switching to grain and other much less labor-intensive crops. So if, if, um, if, if this region had just, you know, if things had taken their course, people would have been just freed because wh why would you continue to feed and house somebody you didn't need the labor of? And some of that happened in the early years of the 19th century around here. But then as the domestic slave trade took hold, there was somebody at hand advertising in the paper every day who would pay you $500, $600, $700, $800 <laughs> for that enslaved person you don't need anymore. And we're talking about a factor of 30 or 35 to convert to today's dollars. So you're talking about you know, $15,000, $20,000, $30,000 that people um, can sell the enslaved for. So uh, the tra slave trade starts to boom around 1810, 1815. There are slave traders um, all over Baltimore, all over Washington involved in this. Uh, the big ports are Baltimore, Alexandria, Richmond, and they're exporting to the mostly to the Gulf Coast. Um, so, and then the scale of it. I mean, I was just shocked to learn. I mean, you know, historians are 
kind of making educated guesses. But the guess is that about a million people were forced to move south and uh, over the 60 years before the Civil War, and that three quarters of them were shipped by slave traders. Uh, about a quarter w relocated with their enslavers because um, this is more American history. The, uh, the land that belonged to the Indians in the Mississippi Valley uh, was becoming vacant because the Indians were being shipped out. So uh, then uh, people were moving south and, and building farms and plantations uh, in that part of the country. So they would sometimes move uh, their, uh, the, the people they enslaved with them to the south. But most of it was through the slave trade. So it's just the scale of it. And finally, the tragedy of it, which we've already talked about, um, the destruction of families. If you, you know, if, if, if your father, mother, child, sister, brother, uh, you know, was grabbed by the slave traders one day, uh, you might literally never see them again, never talk to them again. So just the scale of the tragedy and then just the fact that nobody knows about it. Sorry, I'm going on too long, but your other question was? How uh, small get away with it? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't want to say too much about that, but, but uh, I mean, he was a very canny guy. And uh, I think the one thing I'll say about that is, um, you know, if you think about what it was like to be black in an American city at that time, even as a free man, he was somewhat invisible. And it's obvious um, from some of what he writes that he would lurk and listen and eavesdrop and observe. And uh, people, white people, white slaveholders would have conversations with him, uh, sorry, in front of him uh, with their friends, with their family, that they probably would regret, <laughs> would come to regret having in front of, of this guy. But I think, you know, the way I think of it is he, he turned um, this sort of fact of uh, racism in American society in the 1840s into a superpower because he could kind of be everywhere taking notes. In fact, at one point in what we call in the newspaper business a house ad, um, Charles Torrey writes up this, uh, so, so Smallwood's letters become quite a hit in this paper with, uh, with the readers. And so he actually makes house ads for these letters. And he, and he also addresses uh, the, uh, the slaveholders of Washington and Baltimore and says, Sam Weller is, Weller, Sam Weller, the pseudonym, is lurking among you taking notes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's maybe he got away with it for a long time because, because of uh, racism. We've got five minutes left, so keep those question, uh, keep those answers short. Yes, yes, ma'am. Scott, <laughs> the lightning. Round. Okay, so here's the deal. I think the story is absolutely fascinating. I'm looking forward to reading it. But what is just making my head hurt hmm. is that the concept of the domestic slave trade yes. that you're talking about is the real story. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be m missed unless mm -hmm. we state it like really straight. Yes. What we need to understand, and I'm sure most people do if they stop and think about it, is that for a long period in this country, the major economic asset mm -hmm. was human beings. Absolutely. And the value of those human beings varied from time to time and from area to area. I'm from South Carolina and Georgia. My folks bought each other mm -hmm. in order to be free mm -hmm. because you couldn't be emancipated after the Haitian Revolution mm -hmm. for fear mm -hmm. and also for the other, um, the stone, other things that happened that made them so afraid. But the concept has to be understood. If we're talking about people were assets in an economic system Absolutely. and that the economic system went through phases such that your asset could lose value, as you mm -hmm. say, when you could no longer you know, get maximum value out of their labor, but they could grow in, in value when you could figure out where you could sell them. And if you could move them from up here, where there, the prices were lower because there was a surplus, 
down to New Orleans, you could make a lot of money. If you could move them from South Carolina yeah. to yep. Louisiana yep. and Mississippi, yep. you could make yep. money. Yep. And so, it was all about so, that. So let me say, let me, let me just say one thing. I, I totally hear what you're saying that the story is not the Underground Railroad, it's the slave trade. I think in many ways that's absolutely right. I, I'm using the figure a million for the slave trade, maybe maybe three quarters of a million. The you know very very rough estimates that have been made for people who've successfully escaped to freedom is more in the realm of a hundred thousand. So by that measure, uh, you know the 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 forced migration south would be ten times greater than the the escape north. So I totally agree with you about that. However, you know, I think if, if you, these, these two things are very much tied up with each other. And that's why I think it makes sense to write about them together. And I also think people might be more willing to read about the oh, slave absolutely. trade in the context Absolutely. of the whole story. But yeah, because it's a story and it's, it's digestible. Yeah, but you obviously know but this is very well. Simultaneously, so, yeah. somebody, we should be talking about domestic slave trade. Absolutely. And we should be just really explicit about that Absolutely. economic system. Absolutely. So while you've wrote, written this nice investigative story that I really want to read, I want to see you on a panel with, people, with economists <laughs> who are talking about the domestic slave yes, trade yes. from 1600 Yes. To um, seven uh, to eighteen sixty. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for your book. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, you've sort of facetiously described this as ancient history, mm -hmm. but uh, what lesson is in this ancient history for us in current times when the new fugitive slaves are pregnant people? Ah, interesting. I mean, I guess all I would say is that um, the example of Smallwood and Tory, you know, I, I often found myself thinking about them as activists and as activists who were extremely daring and risk-taking and literally putting everything on the line, their lives on the line for the cause that they believed in. And, you know, when I think about activism today, I, I, there is, there's a lesson there. Um, I don't want to say how the story ends, um, but it can be a very dangerous business to take on entrenched power. And um, so that's a lesson, and I think um, perhaps we need to look around at our world, and we may not find slave traders at, on the mall and at the Inner Harbor, but um, there may be, uh, you know, kind of embodiments of evil <laughs> that really need to be confronted. And uh, so, you know, in a way, I think, I think there are echoes um, uh, of this story today. Thanks for the uplifting note to end on. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming. You can buy books here, and Scott will sign them. Scott, thank you, and congratulations. Thanks, Celine. She was very easy on me. Thanks, everybody, for coming. All right, thank you, everyone, for coming.